You are listening to the Feedback Podcast with my homie Back. All right, and we're live. Welcome to the Feedback Podcast, everybody. My name is Back, and always next to me, I got my boy Miko in the house. Hello, hello. Byron is here too. What up? Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. And we are live here at Antone's on East Fifth. This is really, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Seriously. One of my favorite venues in Austin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, live from nice the venue. legendary Antone. I want to send a big shout out to the staff for one. And two, big shout out to Will Bridges who made this happen. I really yep. appreciate it. I mean, this man's been uh, really grinding for years, doing great things in the city. So uh, definitely big up to him. If I could, I'd like to add to that uh, also the memory and, and spirit of Clifford Antone. Yes, who yes, brought yes. This great Antones shout out. To, uh, to Austin and the is a 41 year legacy now. This wow. is the home yeah. of blues. How, how many years? 41 years. 41. Antones has been alive and well in Austin and no end in sight. The guys wow. that are at the wheel now are the right guys for it. So I mean, right. this is an institution. It's one of those, like, if you come to Austin, you got to come to Antones. Oh, yeah. It's just worldwide sure. known. And uh, I really appreciate everything that, you know, that Cliff has done uh, for Austin. Now, we got to start the show. We got to acknowledge what happened last night. Indeed. Uh, you know, people go out and there was, uh, there was a shooting last night on 6th Street. Uh, one, one person dead, three wounded. You know, it happened on 6th Street at after 2 o'clock. So 2.17. It was a, yeah, yeah, which is when everybody gets out of the bars and um, our and condolences like to the families of the victims. They're still looking out for the guy. Uh, for the suspect, and uh, this sucks. It really hurts. I mean, I got to, you know, God knows how many miles I put on that street <laughs> <laughs> over, the, over the years. I think we, all, we, we can all agree, right? Everybody oh, yeah. in yes, here. Definitely. Yes. Uh, so but the young woman, Technica Moultrie, who, who lost her life in one of the heart of entertainment districts, not just in our state, mm -hmm. but in the country. This place is world known for a good time. It's a shame that that stuff goes on here. It's unacceptable, and if anybody has any information, I'd like for them to come forward, send any videos to the Austin Police Department, any information, confidentially or publicly. It definitely needs to come out. We, we can't accept this kind of behavior here. Yeah, you There's can. There's uh, no place for it. You can actually call if you have any information. Call the homicide tip line at 512-477-3588, and any, any information you have that can move the investigation forward, that'd be great. So, uh, I mean... This is tragic, and let's hope this doesn't happen again. I, I want to put a small silver lining on it and say that, you know, the one thing, this is a big event, but it's thankful that it's a big event because it's happened so rarely. Right. With, with the number of people that walk through, all the tourism, all the locals, how often does this ever happen? It's pretty rare. You look at other cities, and they have things like this happen quite a bit more frequently. So, you know, I'm appreciative that it doesn't happen as much, but mm -hmm. very sad that it happened at all. Right. So just yeah. bear that in mind. Keep True. supporting your businesses. This is something rare in Austin. Don't think it's gonna happen every time. It's pretty rare. I think the last, I've been down there when there was a shooting, but that was, Byron, you admit, it was like 2000. Yeah, it was the a last wow. time. Yeah, it was yeah. two people got into a tussle, started r fighting essentially on 6th Street, and um, guy pulled out a gun mid-fight. Fortunately, he shot it you know, directly up and not at towards the crowd, towards anyone, but it was definitely uh, a scary time. Right. Actually, there was a second incident in the garage, and people that were around subdued the guy who pulled out a gun. So, you know. Yeah, it sounds like he got a stomping. Yeah, I, I don't think, think he did. <laughs> he got taken to the hospital. <laughs> Good old Texas stomping. Oh, yeah. Which I do approve of that. Some idiot pulls a gun <laughs> out. Whoop his ass, whoop his, his ass. ass quick. <laughs> okay. I mean, um, yeah, so, man, this sucks. This sucks. But anyway, let's move on. In case you didn't know who's been speaking here, uh, we got Greg in the house. How you doing, man? Doing very well. Official Thank you introduction. Well. Thank you. Yes. How are you guys I doing? I mean, doing well. one of the most talented photographers Thank you. I've known Thank and you. I've seen. I mean, seriously, you've been doing this for how many years now? Uh, I'm, I'm between six and seven years pursuing photography as a craft, but I, I don't, I, I couldn't even speak to a, a time length where I've actually been working well in mm -hmm. the industry of photography. But I, I would say about seven years, full, full amount of time in thus far since I bought a camera. And... I like to get into your uh, backstory. No pun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Come on now. I gotta say it. Sure. I gotta say it. Like you didn't. Every episode that has shit. to be. Yeah, yeah there's a backstory. Everybody, everybody has a Let's backstory. Let's take this back a second. Where did you come up with that <laughs> shit? Okay, go ahead, man. So, born and raised in Houston. Houston, correct? Texas, 1976. And what was? I mean, you have a special connection with music because I mean, yeah, I've known you for you know, 
live music, photography, going to shows, and capturing these moments with artists, whether they're on tour or on stage. So how did that connection with music start with you uh, growing up in Houston? Uh, man, riding my BMX around the neighborhood and listening to Walkmans with, uh, you know, Beastie Boys, Van Halen, U2 oh, wow. even, playing in my headphones. Uh, did you have the, the dad with the record collection? I, I actually had a, a, a family that music was pretty big uh, in the house. We had a jukebox uh, that played 45s in, in, a, in a game room that had a pool uh -huh. table. Uh, family of mine had owned beer houses and ice houses and, and whatnot in the South for a long time. So uh, being around country music was, was pretty common for me in Houston. Um, also having the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo was a lot of influence towards that live performance aspect of music. Mm -hmm. um, never really looked at becoming a player. Uh, really? Was, was made to do piano lessons as a young kid and just kind of hated any sort of structure or, or uh, you know, classical form of studying. Like, school wasn't big on me. Uh, <laughs> but music always left its mark. Like, I loved songs, uh, mm -hmm. even as a kid, and, and still now can recall moments and times that, that probably would have been lost in the fray. Uh, had there not been music there for me to recall those those things and events in my life so I can I can catalog periods or events in my life by first recalling a song that I love and then it will bring back instant memory so it's always had this deep root uh, in in my my fond memories so did anybody in your family play or yeah quite a few people in my family have, have been musicians uh, and and unfortunately they, they pass away but I've been blessed with inheriting almost all the instruments from previous family members. So I've got a piano, I've got a guitar, a trumpet, clarinet, mm -hmm. uh, I've got an accordion, uh, and all of them just sit there and collect dust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but every now and then somebody will come to the studio and I'll photograph portraits of an artist that forgot to bring a guitar or, you know, needs an instrument. So those instruments can evidently be seen through through my catalog of work mm -hmm. by somehow making its cameo into somebody's arm. So That's it's kind of neat to have it. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you, you brought up a point about music and, and having a, a tie to early parts of your childhood. It's I want a, a quick shout out to our last podcast where we talked about music and discovering new music and how a lot of times the music that you're familiar with is the music from you coming of age. Yeah, right. Definitely. And kind of yeah. pegging that. Um, what is some of the music that you recall, like coming up Man. and that you, you know, you really love? <laughs> What's Just your favorite yeah, era yeah. of music as well? Well, that, that, that's probably an unanswerable question because it's so broad. <laughs> uh. It's so broad. <laughs> and and there have been so many influential artists through the eras that have reached a level of genuine artist art, craftsmanship. Like they're, right. they're just such open, honest musicians that it's evident that it's, it's real. I think that's always been my precursor. Like, you know, at a very early age, swimming in the pool with my, again, waterproof Walkman. There's some wow, you're placement. fancy, man. <laughs> Water, there, there's some product placement. If you can find one, <laughs> try and find well, a cassette. If you can for find it. a Walkman. But yeah. I, I remember swimming around in a swimming a pool in Galveston, you. listening to Rush, Rush's greatest hits mm -hmm. on my waterproof Walkman at age eight. So listening to rock and roll and, and Van Halen, Rush. Uh, I would say Eric Clapton was one of my first major influences that led me to the blues, which is, has become probably my primary focus in music is blues and rock. So mm -hmm. Eric Clapton led me to Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, you know, all the kings. All yeah, the yeah. You, you did your own digging or you had well, someone you know, show you? you? You'd listen to songs and you get to love them. And then some at some point you, you'd look at the, f the song credits and you'd be like, damn, that's who's this guy? F. King, you know, yeah. then you find out, oh, he's from Dallas, Texas, the yeah. Texas Cannonball which uh, Freddie King used to play the Armadillo World Headquarters, and he got signed by Leon Russell, who was just an Oklahoma guy, but he, he had uh, Shelter Records. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he signed Freddie King. Freddie King's arrangements became much more dynamic and, and kind of took his sound to another level. But this is a guy that influenced Stevie Ray, Jimmy Vaughn, ultimately probably even Gary Clark Jr., because mm -hmm. he, he grew up under that shadow of, of all these greats in a vein of music that was kind of... The poor man's music. It wasn't. It wasn't easy to market that kind of music to major stars, uh, or to, you know, affluent wealthy white people, mm -hmm. until the Beatles and the Europeans started to bring that that British invasion over. So you have like the Beatles, and you've got uh, Led Zeppelin, the Who, and the Rolling Stones, who who made m most of their fame by covering artists' music, like you know Blind Lemon, Jefferson, and and these guys that were Delta Delta bluesmen that lived impoverished lives, but but they were the juke joint kings of their era. So them finding this music and bringing it over and popularizing it, putting it on television at a time when they wouldn't put the, the artists who created that kind of music on TV 
because mm -hmm. uh, of segregation and, and sheltered racism and hidden hidden agendas. But they'd put some British white kids up there and let them play that music, and then it was marketable. So did you so feel like that there was a draw to come to Austin because of the music? No, I came to I came to Austin before I'd even picked up a camera. So oh, it true. was just a, a town <laughs> where I, I really loved the town. Uh, and my wife and I had just gotten married, and we were like, dude, let's go check out Austin. And we were at an age and, and professional level that it was okay to move towns and, and reinvest yourself. So mm -hmm. it was going to be still years from the time that I moved here before I picked up a camera. So did you, when you got here, what was the scene like? Were you going out to shows? Were you going to Antones back then? Did I you wasn't really into going to live music as often. I was a lot more into hot rods uh, and classic custom cars. And uh, I bought a car uh, <laughs> from one of the guys that owns the Austin Speed Shop, a, a guy named John Joyo. Well, one of his partners is a guy named Corey Moore, who's been Jimmy Vaughn's manager for 15 or 20 years. So uh, that was kind of my first in, you know, social involvement in anything like a music scene. They would have parties and they'd hire musicians. And then my first paid gig came from Corey Moore, uh, who asked me to shoot a, a private party at the Austin Speed Shop during Lone Star Roundup. And took one or two really great photos and about a thousand shitty ones. <laughs> and uh, those, those two photos gave me enough traction for them to uh, arrange a photo pass to come to Chicago, shoot Jimmy's CD release at Buddy Guy's Bar called Legends in Chicago. And then two days later, Jimmy played the uh, Clapton Crossroads Festival, which is like a guitar, a, a guitar guy's Super Bowl, probably. Mm. Uh, and that's where Gary Clark made his, his first appearance in front of 20,000 people and had, had just recorded his EP with Doyle Bramhall, another Austin guy. So uh, di did you know what you were doing at the time when I you picked I up the camera? I, or? I don't think I knew what I was doing. I, I think when I look back, the photos are kind of shit compared to what I expect my photography to look like now. I uh -huh. didn't really have a style or an understanding. You know, I had to look up terms like ISO and f-stop on Google. Uh, I, had no, uh, no, I had no vocabulary, but I had a, a visual representation of what it should look like because guys like Scott Newton, Jim Marshall, Bob Gruen, uh, more current guy, maybe Danny Clinch. Uh, these guys had been such great examples for somebody that wanted to pursue documenting music. If you looked at your work and then you looked at theirs, you may not be able to define it or, or verbalize it, the mm -hmm. difference, but you could see it inherently that there was an understanding, not just of the music or the moment, but the, but the craft. With, with photography and what you do, it's, 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 I love to hear someone who loves music. I can just hear it in your voice and the way you talk about it. Um, does that translate in some form of fashion in how you capture it uh, in your photography to capture that same thing that you see and feel? Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, there was a time where I wanted to capture like the perfect shot. Like my, my definition or expectancy of per perfect was more about the exposure con uh, values and everything had to be so right. Uh, and, and when you kind of let go of that expectation, you kind of start to feel the music, you kind of let go of those constraints that keep you from taking pictures of moments that, that tell stories. Mm -hmm. uh, when you change your, well, when I shifted my focus from taking a perfect exposed shot, you know, and it went to capturing the moment, I was able to like be a little more forgiving. And then in that, in that looser uh, gray area, I think that's when the pictures started to become more like what I wanted them to feel like. Um, so getting away from all the classical expectations and, you know, constraints of it and, and letting it be a little bit more emotional I think that's when it became something that I knew I was on to something, and it, it, I had no idea that it was going to take this long to learn it, <laughs> uh, and, and that I would still be learning, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of a necessity. Is it's funny, that it. sounds like how musicians talk about their craft as well. It's like when you stop trying to be formulaic about it and hit every single point, and you just do it and more of do it out of love and just kind of improv sure, a little bit. Sure, sure. So after doing that, sh that uh, shoot in Chicago, we are like, okay, that's it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to shoot artists and go on tour and hang out with all the cool cool kids and yeah, I may have thought about that <laughs> a few times you know but there's there's romanticism in it and then there's the reality of it uh, turning a buck had to, had to start becoming somewhat of a, a focus as well so I shot a lot of weddings you know uh, right which I'd, I'd rather shoot myself than shoot another one <laughs> but <laughs> uh, well you made that sense. decision so yeah so uh, yeah, you know, it, it was it was always an idea, but I think uh, after a few years of having that kind of dream, you start to realize that it's a lot more difficult to turn it into a, a viable business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, even now, I still shoot other things, you know, portraiture of, of people that are not involved in music at all. Um, I think uh, I think you just gotta gotta evolve and be organic about it, 
if you're if you're closed minded to like this has to be it this is what i'm going to def define as as my success and my happiness right then you may never have it so i think being open to just like let's just roll with it see where it goes take it when i need it take it when i can get it you know i think i think that's that's more my approach so you didn't have that that dream of I'm going to be in magazines. I'm going to be. Oh, I still dream about it. <laughs> 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 you know, that shit. Hasn't changed. <laughs> you always got to wake up. Uh, yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> how, how did you get connected with the Austin scene and, you know, okay, starting yeah, yeah. following artists and going on tour sure. with them? Okay, so uh, let's take it back again to uh, that, that part when I discussed about the Austin Speed Shop, Corey Moore's relationship with Jimmy. Well, there was a young guy uh, named Michael Weed. He, there still is a young guy named Michael Weed. Uh, <laughs> is he still young? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael Weed is. Uh, he was working as kind of like Jimmy's right hand guy, touring here in town. Like he just worked for Jimmy Vaughn's brand. Uh, and Michael Weed and I became really good friends. And one night, uh, long before being a photographer, he called me. He said, "Hey, why don't you come downtown, get drunk with me and my boy Gary? We're gonna walk around, get drunk." And I would say that relationship with Michael Weed has probably been the most important relationship. And and being introduced to the, the Austin scene uh, and then becoming friends with Gary Clark Jr. Uh, and when Gary signed his his contract with Warner Brothers asked me to shoot some photos and you know it was it added credibility to me I including that time in, in Chicago those those events and that opportunity getting in that door audit added credibility to me that I felt like I didn't deserve at the time uh, and I think that's what inspired me to really get better at my craft because the people I was photographing were so highly re regarded and respected in their craft that I owed it to them as much as I did to to my pursuit of my you know my deal. So that's kind of my introduction into it. But then after that, you know, you, you get to meet people, and as long as you can let it organically happen and you don't push for something and mm -hmm. don't have an agenda, then you can create an actual relationship with these guys and and show your your genuine you know uh, character be approachable, be disarming or charming at the same time. And I think through those relationships, people then, they want to see what you're doing. They, they hear you, hear them. They can't wait to hear you. So it's like, hey, man, I, I like, I dig it. Why don't you come hang out? And I think that's kind of how it's all started. But it started with initial introductions that weren't involved in, in this pursuit. So. Good. Right. So, uh, by the way, I love that outlook you have and that you wanted to rise to the level of the musicians that you were photo um, oh, yeah. uh, photographing. That's awesome. It's a good outlook. Uh, connection with that. So clearly you met some people in your initial breakout moment. Gary Clark Jr.'s name has been dropped a couple times. Um, have you ever met a star? Maybe it was Gary Clark that had you starstruck. I mean, as you break into that business, you start meeting all kinds of Oh my of God, I can't believe I'm sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd Who was your 16-year-old girl, year girl moment? Well, <laughs> I, I'll say this. I don't know that I ever get that terrified or, or, or just kind of struck. But there, there, you know, Jimmy Vaughn is a guy that, that commands great respect. He's he's a he's a sober mind. He's a, he's a he speaks with conviction. He's got this look that you know he's focused on you, and it, it it'll stop you in your tracks if you're bullshitting around him. He'll call you on it. But he's very generous and kind, and allows me to hang out sometimes when when I've been invited and, and it's time for me to do my job. But he walks into a room and sometimes it takes the air out of my lungs. I forget how to speak <laughs> because I just want to show the respect that's deserved. And, and uh, you know, I, I'd say he's probably one of the early on guys that I knew was just way up there. And I shouldn't even be back here in the green room, you know. <laughs> so it, it, uh, that's kind of stuck. But since then, it's it's given me a platform to, to be a little more confident because I've, I've been able to perform well in his presence. So I think I can do it with pretty much anybody if I can handle Jimmy. Yeah, you started pretty high, so, right? <laughs> Everything else yeah. was easier. I'd say so. W with that in mind, I mean, again, keep on the celebrity star conversation, okay. yet it doesn't necessarily have to involve them. Um, as you're on tour taking these photos, any, any memorable stories you'd like to share uh, wow. that just a good takeaways? Or maybe there's a mini, but can you choose well, one or two? Well, I'll, I'll say the, the most recent is, is pretty it, – it's still f – I'm still finding the meaning behind the experience that I just went through, but – uh, some guys that, that uh, live here own this, this hotel in Dallas, the Belmont Hotel, mm -hmm. and they financed a private surprise portion to the Newport Folk Festival, which is this you know really old folk festival that George Ween started in, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. He also was the founder of the Newport Jazz Festival, and it's this iconic festival where Bob Dylan has had epic, epic performances, and Chris Christopherson uh, performed uh, as Johnny Cash's guitarist 
1969, and Johnny Cash was there to star in, 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 in the headlining role and said, you know what, I'm not going to go on unless you give th this guitarist of mine 30 minutes of, his, of, of my set. And George Ween was like, nah, fuck that, no way. So Johnny said, all right, well, let's, let's go, boys, we're out of here. And so he quickly Ween, Ween uh, s you know, submitted 30 minutes and gave it to Chris Christopherson, and he had this epic performance uh, and hadn't been back since. Wow. And so he was one of the stars that was brought in as the surprise guests. Him, Joe Ely, and Terry Allen, and buddies of mine from Dallas, uh, uh, the Texas Gentlemen, were the band that was brought to back them. Mm -hmm. So I was on tour with these guys, and, and Chris was supposed to do a two-song, three-song set acoustically, and ended up playing a 19-song <laughs> Greatest Hits catalog by himself on you know acoustic guitar in front of about 120 fans. And the room, you could have heard a pin drop uh. in that place. And there were moments in his voice would crack, and the emotion of the song, he would recall stories and times that may have inspired those songs and he'd shed a few tears and you could look around and count the tears in the room so That's it was amazing. it was a very deep and emotional moving thing that that i had to i had to photograph it and it's like how the fuck do i not just stand <laughs> here yeah, exactly shit? i'm supposed to I'm supposed to work doing this like fuck this so uh after about you know 14 songs i took a break and i went outside and the band that had opened up for him i sat and just started talking and it was just like such a moving experience that we connected quickly and it right. was this open, honest conversation. And unbeknownst to me, the young, the young girl that I was talking to was Chris's daughter. Huh. Um, and I guess she was kind of moved at my honesty and, and kind of the banter, so she brought her mom over, who I still didn't realize was her mom. <laughs> uh, and they, they, I guess, were somehow uh, Im impressed with, with the character that was shown that they, they quickly came over and brought me a tour laminate and said, hey, you can meet up with us anytime you like. Here's here's a laminate. Just wow. You don't wow. have to call or write. Just show up. But if if you'd like to, here's my phone number. And so it, that was that was kind of a neat deal. That after that, I went back to the bus and was peeling Polaroids. And the the gentleman that had invited me over uh, to do this tour uh, turned the corner as I was turning the corner, and it just was like it hit me that these memories are going to be significant to me for for a very long time, even though I wasn't able to live in the moment seeing the images immediately reminded me the, the weight and the brevity of, of kind of of what this experience was and what it might mean to me down the road so i, I you know wow. i shed tears as a man well, you know wow. not not proud <laughs> to say but in in that context i'm not ashamed of it so th those are cool stories that'll Indeed. always be with me no we were gonna get into uh, you know living in the moment versus capturing it in the later on on the show but yeah i want to get into your history with antones okay and so you got to work with Gary Clark Jr. Like how is that your when you started, you know, I'd say pretty much so. I mean, uh, Gary was just somebody I was familiar with. So I felt secure in going and taking photos before I felt secure in what I would produce. Mm -hmm. So there was a little insecurity in it, but it was OK to be the journalistic photographer that could kind of hide and shoot other people that are so intimately committed to their, their acts of, of performance you can be the fly on the wall. You don't distract the, the artist from the moment. And right. so I could voyeuristically observe and document this thing while I'm learning my craft. So shooting around guys like Gary or Jimmy, who's people I'm familiar with, it was easier for me to go ahead and kind of release myself to that, that pursuit. Whereas doing portraiture early on, it was hard for me to not kind of freak out in my head, you know, and be trying to adjust the camera and get the settings right and being able to maintain the moment. Uh, I would say Antone's was, was pretty crucial for me and, and having an area where I could freely come and go, uh, practice my craft, kind of hone my trade, learn it, uh, without really being too on the spot, you know. So I was shooting for free just out of desire. Mm -hmm. uh, I never oh, got nice. paid for that shit back then. <laughs> 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 and every now and then I still don't. But, but the, <laughs> what's the timeline? Is that, you know, one year after I'd your say it's, it's a good period of about four years it took me to learn, learn how to shoot. And oh. during that time, I probably had a camera in my hand every time I left the house. So uh, it was, you know, shooting, adjusting, shooting in low light situations uh, and just pushing, pushing and pushing and trying to find a better shot. Uh, Sounds like uh, practice, practice, practice. Oh, yeah, practice, practice. Sure. You got That whole 10,000 hours thing. I, th I think it took longer yeah. than that. You know? <laughs> so I'm still learning. You know, one thing about your pictures is that, you know, you love shooting black and white. And... It's true that when you look at a black and white picture, it, it looks cooler. You're like, <laughs> oh man, this is, it, it really, it's a different feel than just shooting color. Can you speak to that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, I, I heard, I don't remember where I heard it, but it, it stuck with me. Uh, 
color photos for clothes, black and white for souls. It's it just takes a little bit of that other distracting element out of it, and mm -hmm. it, it's just it's black or white. You know, it's, there's a lot less involved in in the dressing up of it, and it's more about the moment. And you know, it it, it it's it's got to play into the psychology or, or somewhere of what was branded to us a long time ago through Time Life magazine yeah. and journalistic images of war and, and, you know, what was popular, you know, the Onassis Kennedy, you know, empire, you know, it was all black and white stuff mostly that was easily, you know, reproduced, printed and, and distributed to the mass people. So I think it just speaks to a, a more antiquated, you know, old school, genuine thing. And, and I think I, I, I'll probably say genuine a lot in this thing because uh, I think it's a <laughs> pursuit fine. of honesty and, and just taking myself out of it as much as possible, even though it requires my emotional connection to it to, to exist, like for me to emotionally be attracted to this, this story and how do, I, how do I capture it? How do I document it? Um, so I, I think it's got something to do with so your my belief that it's what's Your real. technique as far as you know, shooting the, the capturing that moment, or you, okay, shoot, 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 and somewhere in there there's a moment that you caught, or you're just, you It's know. a mix. It's a mix. Sometimes there's so much going on. Yeah. And it's happening so fast that you know you have to, I mean, you're seeing it unfold in the moment. And when the shutter clicks, it goes dark for a second. So there's a, there's a moment you missed, and you're like, for me, sometimes like, fuck, I got to get another one. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I know that, like, shit, I'm taking 15 photos right now, and they're all going to be good. Yeah, you know, and then you get home and they all suck and you're like, <laughs> so you, you learn about that through experience and every now and then you're like, okay, I better take a few right now because he's moving quick. I know I'm in low light. Shutter's going slow. ISO's high. Let's, let's fucking capture a bunch. Maybe one of those will come out and then maybe you're watching that crescendo slowly happen and you know this artist and you know he's about to throw it the fuck down. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you're on the edge of your seat. <laughs> and, and you're right you see there in the pit. And you hit it. You're like, oh, that one. So I, I was on stage for uh, uh, Rest His Soul, Merle Haggard, uh, and Willie Nelson's performance at Whitewater Theater last year. Mm -hmm. And I went up there with a Polaroid camera. So you can't click, 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 you know, because I shoot a lot of film as well as digital. I'll have four or five cameras in the play uh, at any performance sometimes. So I was on stage behind the drum kit, hiding behind, you know, an amp. And I've got this Polaroid camera, and I, I peek up, you know, find my range on the range finder, which mm -hmm. is your focal point, your distance. Uh, and then I'm like, okay, I go back down, I collect myself, I know the song is kind of lifting up, and they're facing each other, and at this one point, I just stood up, the lights came up, the crowd was lit, and they were playing to each other, and I'd snap one, pull it, and then you go back, and you wait 30 seconds or a minute, and then you peel it, and you hope you got it. Yeah, you hope so you got it. <laughs> it goes both ways. I think you got to know what you're working with, and, and kind of know who you're working with, uh, and it, 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 it affects your approach towards the capture, or the story, or, or get, getting that moment. So there are times, though, during that same concert that I just spray and pray, you know, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any input that you're given on what, you know, your the artist or the client is expecting you to capture? Or is it just no, up to no. you to I, just I, capture what you feel is uh, appropriate at that moment? I, yeah, I think some of them have the respect to, to just say, look, uh, I'm going to play my music. You, you do your thing. You know, it, 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 it wouldn't work if I told them when to do a moment or look back during that time because it's going to affect that moment. So mm -hmm. I think most of them that have hired me have, have come to grips with the idea that, like, hey, this guy's pretty good at what he does, and I know I'm good at what I do. So let's, let's just let each other do that thing at the same time, and I won't fuck with you. You don't fuck with me. Yeah. Don't come out too far on my stage. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, in your who who you wants to do with the camera? <laughs> Speaking <laughs> on that, the, the guy from uh, City and Color – uh, I can't recall his first name, dang it. Uh, I was out too far on the Fun Fest stage one year, sitting next to the drum kit, hiding behind an amp, and he came back to speak to his drummer. And I was like, oh shit, there it is. And I started popping photos, and he looked right at me, and I think it registered, like, this motherfucker right here. And so <laughs> I had a great <laughs> shot of him flipping the bird and uh, publicly made some apologies and, and tagged them on, on one of the social media platforms. And, and he quickly grabbed it, reposted it, and was like, no sweat, bro. It's cool. Love the shot. Nice. But uh, um, anyway. Do you, do you have That's a, a preference? Polaroid versus digital? Wow, man. Mm. If I could, I would rather shoot film and Polaroid only. And I, I, I'd throw all the other film away too. I just, I love Polaroid. It just speaks to me deeply. Mm -hmm. I love how I've learned to capture images with it. 
it's really not a medium that I would advise anybody to go out and buy a shit ton of film just to shoot festivals and music with Polaroid. It's it's obsolete. It's expensive. It's out of production. Right. Um, but I love it. Um, if I had to choose one or the other, I'd say Polaroid. But that's how you started. I, right? I love having all of the capabilities I have. You know, all, all the tools are, are right. fun. You to, want a full fun to tool work belt. With. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some speak better for certain moments, and some are impossible to use. Um, I can shoot really low light, very crisp shots with this digital Sony, uh, and that Leica lens is probably the most expensive piece of equipment I own. Mm -hmm. uh, but I own a lot of less expensive pieces that are still. Oh, pricey. I bet there's a room so in the house. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah, I probably walk around with twenty thousand dollars worth of camera equipment on me <laughs> at Man. a show. So. It's a scary, beautiful thing. I would love to have just one of those expensive cameras, but I like having all of those. Uh, I think they all have their place in my catalog of work. So, uh. you, so at any given time, you have that tool belt, and you, will you switch out in the middle of a show? Oh, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I'll be wearing three cameras just so that I don't have to go back to my bag. But usually I have a place backstage where my stuff will be, like right to the side of the stage. And, and a lot of times I have the freedom to walk across the back of the stage mm -hmm. hiding. So if I need to, I can go behind the curtain, swap out, swap out, and I don't have to kill myself. But I, I work really hard. I think anybody that's ever seen me working uh, a live show, I'm 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 really cooking. So it's not like it's a it's something I take leisurely. Uh, I aggressively, voraciously go after my shots. But good adjectives. Still, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I read up a few. I, I heard I was going to be on on some podcast. But uh, yeah, I would say that. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a benefit to have it all, but it's a burden. Do you, do you go back and retouch a lot of your shots when you shoot digital? You well, know, only when you, yeah. that, that seemed to me like another thing that I just had to get better at. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really good at throwing fully, in, like things that aren't fully necessary, I kind of throw them aside and don't waste time on them. So somehow I kind of felt like doing a lot of post editing was not something I wanted to do a ton of mm -hmm. in, in life. I, I, I spend, I don't know how many hours a month scanning film and, di and Polaroids, and that alone is more time than I want to spend in a, in a computer. Um, I'd rather be out shooting more shots, but it's a necessary evil sometimes uh, to clean up a few shots. Uh, other times, it's if, if I don't have to, I don't, and I'm not a very good post editor, so I'd say I, I do some of it, but I, I really suck at the computer. But you, <laughs> you started to learn on the uh, Polaroid, right? No, I, I learned on a, a Nikon digital camera, oh, okay. which gave me the freedom to shoot a lot of shots, be a terrible photographer, and learn uh, without having any understanding of photography classically. Uh, you know, so it was like go out, go to the bar, dirty bills. I went to all the time. Uh -huh. that <laughs> <laughs> dirty bills. That's dirty bills. Bill. Second shout out. A lot of drinks. <laughs> They, they do sell Mad Dog 2020 there. So oh, yeah. <laughs> if you can't find it at your convenience store. <laughs> but uh, I would go in there with my camera, and we'd, we'd just shoot away and drink away. And, you know, at the end of the night, I'd go home and I'd see some stuff and start, you know, start a little photo album on Facebook. And, you know, that right. social media platform really helped me to get it out there, get some feedback from folks, and then kind of make my adjustments. But in camera, I would shoot 10 or 15 photos, look at it, suck, change the setting. And that's how I had learned like which dials did what, but then I had to do the, the the follow up and go figure out what those dials were, what the word was that you associated with f stop aperture, you know ISO low light capability or the, or the speed time that that film reacts with light is your ISO. So uh, it was like, okay, I want to know what that button does, but what does it mean, and how can right. I have a conversation with somebody that actually understands this this craft? So. Uh, that was my stomping ground. That and Antones and Continental Club, uh, Momos. Momos, yeah, so Momos yeah. Man, yeah. now it's a club with a swimming pool, yes. bro. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I like remember Momos. Swimming. I love cats. Swimming, but I liked Momos better. Cats is gone too. Cats is too. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, um, I remember that time. I'm a, as we transition more into discussion and, and getting our listeners to learn things, the tech nerd at the table, well, Byron is too. I think we actually all are. But to your earlier statement, and back to the question, do you do a lot of post editing? And you said, you know, you do a minimal amount, but you do do some. I still do, yeah, definitely. Question for you. What okay. do you do your post editing on? What uh, is some common apps, applications, sure, sure. programs, et cetera? So when I first started shooting uh, Nikon, it came with some Nikon software. So I used their, their NX2, uh, which is like a, their version of a pro editing tool. 
so you plug in your camera, it allows you to import and file and catalog your stuff, not unlike Lightroom. Uh, okay. But now I use mostly the creative suites from, from Adobe, so Lightroom, Photoshop, uh, and those tools because I started bringing in other, other camera systems. And Nikon, in my opinion, or, or at least, I don't even know if it's my opinion. It just was from the advise, <laughs> advisement of other photographers whose work I respected. They were like, yeah, that Nikon shit ain't so good. Try this. Yeah, most and native apps you they know, give I, I, I still was using the same shit people were telling me not to use for five years <laughs> until I bought this new Sony. Uh, I didn't force myself to learn Lightroom, uh, but now I'm really loving how it works. So, Quick pause. Can you yeah. expand on Lightroom? A lot of our listeners might yeah, not know what that Lightroom is. Lightroom is, is kind of a, a tool that you can plug in your files. It'll help you catalog and transfer your files from your memory card into other hard drives or backup memory, uh, but also gives you the tools to adjust contrast, brightness sliders, color temperatures, and white balances, and, and things like that. And then you can even go as far as like adjusting uh, lens you know, diffractions and, and uh, aberrations in color. So you could really get like in that. there. You, you could, but that's still stuff I really don't fucking know <laughs> how to, what <laughs> it's it used for. You know, I just know that there's, there's things you can read that says, hey, <laughs> fix the distortion. <laughs> like, All oh, that complicated no. technical stuff. Now, yeah. now Photoshop is a, is, I mean, is a free version, but the free version is kind of crappy. I think Lightroom is also another yeah. paid one as well. Like those yeah. are two paid. I apps. pay for a, a monthly fee to Adobe. To Adobe, yeah. I, I pay, like that they pay do by that the now. year the Creative Cloud suite, which yeah. you don't have to buy the fifteen hundred dollars software and then pay them one hundred and fifty bucks or two three hundred bucks to upgrade it every time. Now it's just right. you pay your fee. It's all there. Your two inclusive. It's your, yeah, right at your fingertips. So, uh, I had I, I I recommend that if somebody wants to get into using very powerful editing tools that include video stuff, you know, filing photo manipulation, uh, digital, like full digital composition. Like you can build drawings and paintings and mm -hmm. I mean, you can go crazy with this shit, but <laughs> it's for like 10 bucks a month, like shit. Right, that's oh, pretty damn good If you're good balling deal. on a budget, that's your ball game. <laughs> yeah. you so. uh, I want to go back to that story you told earlier about, um, you know, being out there and capturing that moment and living the moment versus, you know, just being there with your camera and, and capturing that. Sure. Do you ever feel like you're at a show or you're, let's say you're not working. Can, yeah. you, can you turn off that, that photographer mindset? Like, I got to capture this. I, I don't think do I can. This? Great question. I don't think I can. Um, I think it was a, a full immersion to get to where I'm at in my pursuit. Mm -hmm. And the, f the, f the other side of that sword is that when I go to shows without a camera and I can't bring a camera in, it's very difficult not to see moments that that really really bother me. Not able to be not being. It able really to eats you up. Yeah. You're like, damn, oh, I should have caught yeah, this. Yeah, it's it's definitely changed the way I see music without a camera. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a necessary evil. Um, I don't think I would I don't think I would pursue the images as as intense intensely. You know, like as, as I wouldn't be as focused if I didn't have that character in me. You know, so when I do have the camera. I work hard to get it because that's it's what I really want to be doing is interacting with this music that I love. Right. Uh, and it's a way for me to participate a little bit, not with the artists, not with the crowd, but have some sort of rapport with, with what's happening around me. So, yeah, I'm, I am living in a moment. Uh, I'm not able to internalize it fully until later, um, where hmm. some people are just like, oh, they feel it wash over them like waves. Uh-huh. I stop after a flurry of shots and I'm like, holy shit, did y'all see that? <laughs> like, you know, being able to be on stage and see the crowd go through it. And you can see energy sometimes move through the crowd when, yeah. you know, like they start to get hype and it's coming straight from that artist and it ripples out and you can see that shit and you're like, okay, I'm here experiencing this now. I want to capture that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, uh, I think it's definitely changed the way I see music, um, but it also has affected the way that I, accept it while it's happening um so yeah it's it's hard to go to a show without a camera but but now with you know we live in the social media age and everybody has a camera on their phone and yeah. everybody wants to capture that moment yeah uh do you do you partake in any of that like if you don't have your cam your, your I, big equipment camera with you, you know, and you're like let me grab my phone real quick and now i can do this I, I wouldn't say that I never do. I just don't ever think to grab my phone because I've got such a more powerful tool in my hand. Oh, so you always so, have it. It never leaves the house without it, right? No, I, I almost <laughs> always have a camera somewhere. Always uh, carrying a camera heat. That's right. I'm, I'm, <laughs> packed. I'm packed. Yeah, I'm a geek about it. But um, 
you know, again, that, that speaks to the full immersion. You know, if you're going to be a photographer and, and you're not just capturing one genre of, of subject, you know, then you might as well have your tool with you. Um, there are times that I don't, and I'll pull out my phone at a show where I didn't, wasn't able to bring my camera in. Uh, and, yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. The only time that uh, that bothers me is if I'm shooting and there's one guy with his phone right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Ah, yes, know? yes. Or he's got a monopod with a GoPro and he's texting in my shot. <laughs> and it's the best moment of the, of the artist's performance. It's like, motherfucker, get out the photo pit, dog. Like that, you, got no you got no right to be in there if, if you don't respect it enough to, to just focus on the artist that's, that's sharing his soul. You know? Right. You need your own selfie craft, stick to knock yeah. down others. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that, that's my, uh, I'm sure a lot of people's biggest pet, pet peeve when they go to shows and everyone, everybody wants to capture that moment. And you're like, dude, you're at a show. They're putting the show for you. And here you are just yeah. filming the whole thing. And you're like, here's the thing. People who do that, they don't necessarily go back and watch it. I don't think they do. A lot of it's them not for them. A lot of them immediately look down and start making their post and typing words and right. thinking about what they're going to say about how cool this moment is. And then they miss every moment right after that. Right. But I'm, I'm guilty of that shit too every, sometimes. We all are. So we I'm all are. Say, so are you. But, you all are, by the way. <laughs> yes. And at the same time, yeah, it's, it's, it's some people, I've seen some people pissed about it when I've been sitting in an audience and some guy in front is, is doing something and people are like, sit down, turn off your phone. Yeah. But you see them later on pulling their phone out too. We're all, we're all guilty of it. But it speaks also to the question you asked me, does it affect the way I see music? I think that contraption in our pocket affects the way everybody is, is interacting mm -hmm. uh, with the environment around them, especially at, a, at a, an event that they're so honored to be there and they want to capture it because it's so intimately important right. to them. But, but, the, but then they, they forget that they disconnect immediately after. Well, not only that, they're, they're doing it it's almost bragging rights, really. Oh, hey, yeah. I was here, and sure. then he did this, and I caught it. I caught it. I want to go viral. Everybody yeah. like my post. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, look at me, look as at a me. professional, you're like, I'm ca capturing this moment because um, it's it's important. It, it reveals something about the artist, and that's something that you can all appreciate versus yeah, yeah. somebody capturing a shot from way in the yeah, back. Mine, mine isn't as much about honoring myself as it is about the documentary right. of the moment so or, or the artist's performance and, and its place in historical relevance in that genre of work. Uh, yeah, I think, I think for me it's a, more of a selfless pursuit uh, than it is about, oh, tag me on that shit, dog. So I'm going <laughs> to jump in here as the, um, even though we're all basically the same age on the feedback of, I'm the millennial mindset person at the table. Yeah. So <laughs> he's thirty something. Man. <laughs> we'll just leave it at something. <laughs> I got that Gen X going on, bro. <laughs> it's all right. Go ahead. I'm on the cusp. You can so, have it. You right. can have it. So I'm I'm definitely a person who takes a lot of pictures of the photo, and I take video as well. Sure. But I'll, I'll admit, when I take it, I'm not looking in the camera. Like I'll set up the shot, and then my eyes are looking at right. My live eyes are looking at the show. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I want to take that in. I just make sure I get the good shot. Take it. And as far as what the shots I'm taking. I'm typically taking things that I remember, like, I love when the artist is, like, standing on something or pointing at something, like, capturing that moment. And then the video, I like to capture when that crowd is singing, like, sure. getting that. Yeah. I think they call it frisson, which is a French word. They and call it what? Frisson. Like, that gives you, that gives you chills. Frigid. Like, oh, frigid. Frigion. 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 Sure, whatever. Whatever Keep going. It is. Keep going. I go, <laughs> we I'm right. going to fix your French. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I like capturing that moment on camera because sure. I have gone back and rewatched it. And I also will occasionally type up what I'm writing. I think people know that as well. I love to insert those videos. But it's those, I think, that you can almost, you can re-experience some of that later if you capture that right moment. It will stick with you. A, if. Oh yeah. if. Yeah. But if. if you don't try, you will never capture it. Yeah. So I think to Beck's point earlier, there's a lot of photos that are taken um, at a concert or at a show that people just never look at later I, on. I they agree. never do. They and don't like, if you, whether, if you work for a magazine or for a blog or you're a professional photographer or you're with the tour, you're with the artist, I get it. But if you're just Joe Schmo who just came to the show is just gonna take a picture, he's gonna be blurry. And, <laughs> and you're looking for that perfect one, so you keep doing that and you're like, oh shit, it's not good. Let me make some space on my, yeah. on my phone. I gotta delete some, <laughs> delete my <laughs> kids, <laughs> delete the kids and the wife. I tell yeah. you, I, I give you an example. Yeah. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I got, I was at the Cedar Park Center, uh, and it was the Back to the '90s show, and I got on stage with Naughty by Nature. They asked me, I was in the pit, and they asked me to come up, and I'm on stage, literally deleting apps, 
<laughs> so I can get a shot of, the, of yeah, me in the crowd. And I'm and I, I, I point I'm like, man, fuck this hip hop. Hey, <laughs> oh, ex- exactly. Yeah. So, but we all guilty of that. Yeah, I've got a pretty bad one where I deleted some photos on a on a memory card. Uh, to make room. To make room. Yeah. Uh, and they were of Willie Nelson, I'm ashamed to say. Oh! oh. <laughs> I was just going to say, you don't have to call it the artist, but you did. No, no. I, uh, no I, I, uh, I hope it was worth I it. I couldn't recall if I'd already transferred the images that's, that's or not. That's a good question. Was it and worth I it? I needed room about f- for, for about 50 photos. Yeah. Uh, and I was just like, oh, man. I can't delete any of the other ones because I knew I hadn't transferred them to a memory card or to a hard drive yet. And they were for work. Uh, these mm. were the only ones that were expendable and it's hard to even fucking say that. You know, it's of Willie Nelson, <laughs> probably one of the most important people, in my opinion, that I've ever photographed. He's definitely in the top five. Uh, but that was a hard time. That was a real hard time, but it had to be done. So, yeah, I know about having to delete some shit to make room for somebody else. Wow. But Are you uh, moving? Now, everybody's doing video now. I mean, we're live streaming yeah. online, the YouTube live, all that Periscope. Are you getting right. into video, too? Or? Uh, I'd, s- I'd, I'd be lying if I say I wasn't interested in it. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm just not pursuing a quick growth in it yet. Uh, this camera that I bought has uh, great video capabilities, so uh, I started doing a lot of video capture on this last trip to Newport Folk Festival. Uh, had a very intimate perspective with, with the guys that I was with, so mm-hmm. I was able to capture some video. Now I'm going to have to sit back and learn how to edit, so all that shit I talked about, not post-editing, it's, it's, gonna, it's about oh, to go out the, the final cut. I'm about to have to learn <laughs> some shit. But... Yeah, it's definitely something that I'd like to move into at some point. The, the, the reality of the industry is it's really hard to make it as a still photographer, especially if your focus and major subject of, of documentary is, is music. Uh, the value of a song has gone way down for the artist. True. Uh, the artist really doesn't have a huge budget from the record labels anymore to capture right. visual content, uh, to do album packaging and all that other stuff. So uh, what used to make careers for, for men and women that were just amazing rock and roll and documentary photographers, that just isn't there anymore. So it's, it's become this evolution towards modernizing, finding a way to turn it into a, a buck-making business. Uh, so what do we do differently? If it's not album cover, is it What's live that? shows? Is that the bigger focus now? Is there I another I think it's, it's much more in, in actually selling visual content for PR, promotional purposes, ah. for oh, album packaging. Good call, yeah. That's where you get residual hmm. payment. Very little money in live music capture. Like, I'll do huh. a three-day festival working... 14 to 16 hours a day and get paid $400, $700 for the week. So oh, oh, wow. It's that low. Yeah, but there's there's room to double dip where you could, like, turn and sell some of those images to <laughs> Fader or... The worst case, you go you back know, to weddings. Rolling yeah. Stone, so... <laughs> go back to weddings. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play it, I'll play it. <laughs> I'm, so I'm cutting grass on the weekends. <laughs> if any of you guys need your lawn Are maintenance. Are you a Lyft driver as well? Yeah. <laughs> I actually did have a lawn maintenance company. It was one of my first businesses. Ah. Uh, and it was called the Lawn Ranger. Yeah. Oh, nice. 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 <laughs> but I'd go ahead and drop Lever. that little tidbit on you. So don't be too big to turn a buck somewhere else because uh, it's hard to do it as a music did photographer. Did you pick pictures of your landscape? No, I, I was not into <laughs> photography then. I mean, do you, uh, do you document music like you document your own life? Like, do you... I don't document my own life almost as much as... Uh, actually, almost at all. Uh, oh. It's much easier to look outward than it is inward, um, especially when you have to be the guy with the camera. So I end up in very few photos, but I'll, I'll end up with a lot of them of my friends. Uh, That's cool. And the evidence that I was there is that the photo was taken. So uh, very seldom do I end up in, in the... F- in the focus. And, it, and it's weird to be on the other side of the lens, huh? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> nerve-wracking. It, it really, it, yeah. It's hard for somebody to pull a camera up and not change my mood. Uh, I immediately see it. I'm like, fuck, yeah. God dang it. I'm going to look all <laughs> fat and hairy. I hadn't brushed my teeth. Shit. <laughs> 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 cool. Any uh, advice you want to give to uh, young photographers out there? Because I know yeah. there's a lot yeah, of people yeah. coming up. Let me help set that up a Go little ahead. bit because cool, that's yeah. exactly where I was going. Bring so it home. Bring it home. I love to take photos at contests as I mentioned before, but I don't know the settings to put on my camera. I'm still learning that and I think I'm making a ton of mistakes. Maybe you can help me shortcut a little bit and what are some of the good ISO settings and what is it like aperture? I could be saying that wrong. Yeah, no, it's aperture. What is it? it F-stop. F-stop is is your aperture, yeah. Any um, advice in those areas uh, and best best things to capture? You really have to just go based on what your camera's doing in that environment. Like I have cameras that are very capable of shooting in low light. Uh, at lower ISO settings because I also have lenses that allow me to get a very wide aperture. So imagine the pupil of your eye. As it dilates, you can collect more light information between those blinks, which is your shutter. Right. So 
that break moment down? you're grabbing more light in the same increment of time. So I have the capability of shooting around a 1600 ISO setting at an F4 in an environment that some people can't do uh, with their with their cameras because th maybe their lens doesn't go that wide open. So uh, let me let me interject here and try to layman term some of this. Yeah. So. Less light, higher ISO? Yes, it's, it's definitely counterintuitive. <laughs> um, and then with aperture, okay. the lower the number, the wider it is because it's that many millimeters from being wide open. So gotcha. 2.8 so a wider shot is what you're saying with the aperture? Not a wider shot, just a wider pupil. Oh, gotcha. So more gotcha. dilated gotcha. like the eye. So Capturing more uh, Thanks, buddy. <laughs> nice, nice. Good for you <laughs> the, the umbrella. Good for yeah. Awesome. Hey, do you mind taking the empty one, bro? I mean, just finish up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what I would suggest as, as advice to photographers that are wanting to get into at least shooting live music is to go out there, learn your equipment, uh, but fully immerse yourself in, in the pursuit. If you want to make it a career, then you got to you got to you got to bleed, man. Like right. if you don't care about it, you're not going to care enough to to do it right. So I think really putting your heart into it requires like sacrificing other places you could be doing other things like that's how it is. go get it like if you want to do it fucking do it that's all it takes so I've, I've one tiny question i'm gonna slip in here and that's uh, just again ahead. for our listeners you may not have an answer to this because you may be more advanced but a lot of us take pictures on smartphones a lot of listeners will if they take do you have any suggestions of apps on phones that might help yeah, them either yeah, post edit sure. or taking the picture uh well with this camera i can actually wi-fi cameras to my phone so in the, in, in the moment, while the band is still performing, first song in, I could take a shot or two, send it to my phone, edit it, and then post it immediately or send it to his PR marketing teams. Nice. So is while, there yeah, that, that's quickly becoming the pace at which you have to be able to operate to be competitive in shooting live performances. Right. Because uh, at some festivals like ACL, I know before they sold to Live Nation, they had sold the rights to all the visual content captured to, I think, Red Bull. Huh. Like contract 200 300 grand up front so they had all their photographers sign new contracts hmm. saying they were now not getting artist wages they were getting a, a day labor rate and they no longer could own any of the content they could share it on public social media usage but they couldn't sell an image and profit without the you know the risk of, of suit right you know uh, they no longer owned that visual content now they were just they, they were performing some service a labor um, so hmm. now part of that those visual content contracts and the ownership of that requires that you shoot some stuff, first three songs, you're out of the pit, you gotta haul ass back to the media trailer, get some images edited, turn them in, so they can post while the artists are still on stage and make that like current thing so those fans immediately on their phones can be like, damn, I was at this show, look, look how great that us. is. We're right there, row what, four, what, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what app are you using to make that transfer? Is there a so certain app? This camera, the Sony has, uh, there was a smart share, I think, app, okay. which enables you to like, this camera has its own Wi-Fi signal. You activate it, it comes up right away, you click it, then you go to your smart share and it sends the whole catalog broken Over. down at dates so you can quickly find what you need. And then once you import it, you can open it up and, and I, I use a Photoshop app, which is pretty powerful too. On your phone? Yeah, yeah, so right there with sliders, you do your adjustments, you save it, send it, Square it out, post it on so, Instagram. So again, upvote for Show to Shop. And then you get like 50, 100 likes, you baller. <laughs> Any yeah. other uh, smartphone apps that you'd recommend for upcoming? Man. I, if, if not, no, that's fine. I, really I have some suggestions out there. don't use anything but those. I don't. Okay. And, and uh, if they'd come up with an autocorrect that worked a little better, <laughs> I'd suggest that. But I'll just throw it out there for everyone listening. Um, doing a little research as I always do. Some uh, popular apps that were out there that, that people do take. Um, there's one out there called, uh, it's, it's an acronym, VSCO, and it's a really popular yeah. one out yeah, there. Yeah, I've heard of that. It's I've like a must-have, it. and it's for taking pictures on your, on your phone. It's on both Apple and iPhone. Right. Um, it takes great pictures, great filters, great features. It allows you to publish this like you're talking about. You take sure. a picture, and it'll immediately publish to different social media places, or it can copy to a device or something like cool. that. Um, negatives though, it does have a lot of in-app purchases. So uh. if you want this upgrade, that filter, X, Y, Z, you're gonna have to buy some things in there. Uh, Snapseed's also a good one, both on iPhone and, and Android. Uh, again, one. good editing. I use that one. That's Looks one like I use. yeah, yeah. That's one I use as well. Uh, it works best on Android. It's a Google app. Can you make Maybe? memes with that? Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't think. So. It, okay. Does it have? I've never tried. No. I mean, you can manually Not make the memes. There's one that I use. It's called House Industries has one that's uh, called photo lettering, 
You should check it out. It's oh, really cool. See, there nice. you go. It's awesome. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with that, like making fun of my wife and her friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty sweet. A nice one, I also want to give a good props to, it's a very yeah. popular one, is that Trigger Trap app. And it allows it you, called? Chicken called trap? Trigger, trigger, oh, trigger, trigger Trap. Trigger Trap. Yeah. I said, right? Chicken Trap? <laughs> <laughs> and what it allows you to do is, yeah. you can set up custom triggers on your cell phone so that when certain things happen, it snaps a photo, mm -hmm. like facial recognition. Somebody uh, comes by that you want to take a picture of, it's just looking you know, to snap a picture. Or you can do a hand gesture, or say a oh word what? or sound, and it has different things that trigger it to take a photo, whatever is happening. So it's really good if you're just holding your camera there and waiting for that right moment of that right, right. face to happen. Um, just the other thing I want to point out, there are smartphone accessories out there for, for the, people, the people on a budget. Um, that are starting with their smartphone, which we don't recommend. But there's actual pieces you can add. You can add lenses to your smartphones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's cheap ones that are like $20 or less, which probably aren't any good. There's more medium ones that are from like 50 to 150 And then you have, if you are well invested yeah, in it. Yeah, hundreds of You can get into hundreds. Some of those and that's kits. adapting your phone, your smartphone. Yeah. But again, just another way to kind of break in there slowly but surely. Sure. There, there's actually there. people that make a living going and shooting live music with their phones. There's apps and uh, there's camera adaptations mm -hmm. for your phone, but there's actually people that are out there are getting paid, staffing up people at festivals to just be interactively shooting photos, sending them to content managers, and it's just iPhone or smartphone, camera phone based. So maybe that's maybe that's your entry. I don't know. Maybe that's don't not know. a bad idea. All right, we we gotta, gotta we gotta move along so. because uh, Mr. Val White is, about, is gonna bless the stage Woo. up next. So she's gonna burn it. Uh, up. Quick trivia question, Byron. I'm gonna ask to the crowd so you can get a drink at the bar real quick. All right. So this is actually touching on uh, something that you mentioned earlier. Um, you technically get the answer, I think. Yeah, yeah you did. I think you yeah. did. Oh shit. <laughs> so if you're paying attention. Listening. Yeah, if you're listening, you should get this. What is the name of the rule for concert photographers that dictates when they can shoot pictures? It's multiple choice. So the first. Damn, I don't even know if I know the, the answer. first choice. Is Are you sure I said it? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yep. Okay, yeah. I wish I was listening. <laughs> All right. Once again, what is the name of the rule for concert photographers that dictates when they can shoot pictures? Is it A, the first 15 minutes rule? Oh. B, the first two songs it. rule? C, the top of the show rule? Or D, the three song rule? Anybody know Anybody? out there? Anybody? Anybody? Take a while, I guess. Come and get the microphone if you think you need to four. It's four choices. Any four choices. Yeah, so again, twenty five percent chance of getting it right. Yeah, <laughs> come <laughs> on. Yeah. All you people that are here, like there's like three hundred yeah, people here. <laughs> Phil, you should know <laughs> this. I've never seen <laughs> such a dead crowd, man. It must be me. I'm, I'm what, just what do you think? Top of the show? Does Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. So Sorry. the first the first try was top of the show. Yeah, so let's repeat the answers again. Maybe that. So right. let's just refresh the so audience. So we have. Hold on, we're gonna get y'all. The first fifteen minute rule, the first two song rule, the top of the show rule, and the three song rule. That's right. What did you what say? Is it? What did you say? Speak come on, come on, come here, come here, come here. Guys, keep it down. Come on, just try to answer. Come on, come on up. Come up, come up. What is your answer? Yes. Yes. yes, yes, that is the three it. Song roll. The three song rule. The three roll. song rule. Look at yourself roll. a drink. Yep. What she was your name? Syria. 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 Thank you, Syria. Good answer. So, Syria. Um, again, the answer to the question is a three song rule. So, photographers at, at many concerts can only take a photo, and the first three songs that came with a with a Bruce Springsteen's team was the first one to establish that in the eighties. Um, actually, at the uh, Martin, uh, Martin Madison Square Garden. A lot of people were taking photos, getting it in his eyes. He's like, man, we got to do something about this. And so his staff came up with, hey, we'll let them take photos for the f first three songs. When, uh, when you look your best, because you're right yeah. out there. Right, right. And then and they the got to go. Because then you're not going to look good, and everyone's into it, and we don't want you to mess up. So a little history behind it. Cool, cool. All right. Um, let's we're get into some recommendations. Greg, you got anything uh, you want to recommend coming up? or Man, again, just, just commit or quit. You know, like if, if you want to do it, get after it. If you find that you're not putting up forth the effort, don't, don't waste the space. You know, go find what you're passionate about. Uh, if you feel the draw to, to, to discover it, reach out to people. Um, when I first picked up the camera, I, I, I sent emails to about 15, 20 different photographers whose work I loved mm -hmm. that I knew were still alive. Apparently, you're not going <laughs> to. But I got about five responses back, and, and five of them were top of the list. So guys uh, responded to me with, with very intimate and honest 
uh, information, and it was questions like, should I go back to school? Is there something I should be learning? Who should I, what should I? And, and everybody pretty much had the same answer. So it seemed uniform in, in understanding and comprehension of why they made it. Uh, it seemed like a basic truth, so I would share that with everybody, and that is that uh, take your camera, go out and shoot. If you want to do it, just fucking do it. Where and can people find it. your... Uh, and don't waste your money on the classes and somebody else's interpretation of how you should do it because uh -huh. you will never break away, or it'll be harder to break away when somebody trains you how to do it. Y to be identified as a unique and individual, it, it requires you to explore it on your own find and your to own find style. it yourself and find what works for you because my images look similar to other guys, but you can tell sometimes whose is what, you know, which ones are whose. Right. Or, or you know. So... You know what I mean? Because yeah. there, there's... There's nuances and, and aesthetic values that are unique to the guys that, that are wielding the camera. So I think it's just get out there and shoot and always shoot and keep shooting. So where can people find your stuff? How can people keep up with you? Man, damn. You <laughs> put me on the hot seat. I don't even have a website right now. Well, um, the L Instagram, or, but Facebook. Instagram is one that I have, uh, and it's just What's my Instagram? name. It's at Greg Giannoukas. Okay. Uh, I'm on Tumblr as well. Uh, same and thing? Facebook, yeah. Smug or mug. I also used to work under the trade name El Ojo Photo, which in Spanish is the eye. Uh, it, it came from my in the inception of my idea to pursue photography. Uh, I was at a wedding photographing just for fun, leisurely. Mm -hmm. uh, at a wedding that my best friend was getting married down in Mexico years ago. And uh, I sent some of the photos from that trip to him and his wife. And they sent it out to all of their, their guests. Uh, and 500 people got this you know, album from some novice. And, and I got a bunch of responses that were like, you should pursue this. So I, I was like, oh, Mexico, I. Nice uh, and then I quickly dropped that because I was meeting my heroes in photography and they'd be like, hey, I'm the eye. <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, it just Funny. felt a little egocentric. So uh, yeah, that was, that was it. Last question and really quick. Yeah. What's your next gig? Anything in the Austin area? I actually have to leave here right now because I'm going to shoot uh, a new uh, musician named Whitney, Ro or, uh, uh, Whitney Rose is uh, out in Dripping Springs, probably in Boom. a field waiting for me right now. Cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap this up. We'll do the pics uh, later. We'll just add it to the, to the audio. Cool. But I want to thank everybody for coming through. Thank you. Thank Shout you. out to Jones. Thanks for putting up with me. Big thank you to hey, Will guys, Bridges. Thank you very much. Greg. Thank all you. the best to you. Thank you so much for being on cheers, the show. Cheers, cheers. Thank, thank you. you, Mal Barton and over there. Yes. Shout out to all the Anton staff. And uh, you can follow the Feedback BAK on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We do this every week at a different spot. Uh, make sure you like. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and on SoundCloud. Just look it up, the Feedback. Miko, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, back. Byron, Byron, thank you. Thank we you, shout to out Chris. To Chris much love to Chris behind thank the scenes. Thank you, guys. Thank you very and, uh, much. Thank you very much. Mr. Bill White thank is going to bless the stage, so make sure you stick around. Thank you so much. You have a good one. Ciao, Peace. ciao. Out.